So what my aim is, is to cover my background, um, Emirates strength and most of Dubai, starting strongman, how I started strongman, Scotland and Britain's strongest man, under 105 kilos, the upcoming event that I'm pushing for, and then the deadline. So my background, a lot of people would know this, was pro youth football. Um, I used to play uh, for Celtic as a goalkeeper, but I was too short, so I didn't actually make it. Um, from there, when I was 16, I went to the Royal Marines, where I did um, eight months of, let's say, the hardest military training in the world. And I progressed on to becoming a physical training instructor in the Royal Marines. Um, so to get to that level, yeah, you sort of had to be, let's say, mentally um, be able to cope with that. At the end of my Marines career, I sort of pushed into bodybuilding, and so I wanted to see where I could push my body, let's say, physically and mentally in a different environment. Um, where I managed when I was, I think it was 20, I managed to get the Scottish UKBFF uh, champion, junior champion. Then my sort of um, strongman, let's say, career started where I did sort of local events. I went from a, a very local event straight into a, a European Giants Live qualifier where Eddie Hall was competing. So I went from local, not having a clue, straight into the, the mix. And uh, I'll tell you more about that uh, later on. And then I went into All Ireland Strongest Man, which was last year. And then I went to the Scotland Strongest Man and Britain Strongest Man this year, uh, where I managed to finish first. But the, the very first competition I did was a team event. My team won, um, I came second. And then the Giants Live European Qualifier, I didn't really understand the weight categories. So I went into the open category, and there was Eddie, there was X, Y, and Z in this category. and. I think I came second last. I was totally, totally unprepared, but I was willing to go in there and put up a fight, sort of thing. And then I went to All Ireland Strongest Man. I actually competed as a guest um, there, where I managed to, I think he came third in that competition, but they couldn't actually present me the trophy at third. Um, but I managed to get a qualifier for Europe uh, that way last year. And then I went on to win Scotland Strongest Man and British Strongest Man this year. So before I start, you're going to see uh, this logo in the background, which is Everett Strength. The aim of Everett Strength initially was to create foundations in Dubai for strongman as a sport to grow, because when I first turned up, I was the only guy doing it, and there was no, literally no strongman equipment, there was nothing. Um, and it got to a point where I had one Atlas stone and we got people trained with this one Atlas stone and gradually we've built, slowly but surely, we've now got a strong man room. So that, the aim was to build a, a foundation where a strong man could grow. Um, alongside building the strong man community with events, like the Atlas stones event we did earlier in the year, training where we do the, the sort of strong man classes, even having the equipment in there and seeing PTs train for strong man, for me, it's going to be a benefit. And then leading on to the strongman competitions where we started with Dubai, Dubai Strongest Man, Emirates Strongest Man and now in December we're doing Middle Eastern Strongest Man. And then last but not least is just to find talent, it's just to find guys who I can push as Emirates Strength athletes into the bigger competitions that I, I sort of push for. And then has everyone heard of Worst Dubai? Has everyone heard of World's Ultimate Strongman? Uh, in October, we are going to be bringing the World's Strongest Man to Dubai, essentially. But we're going to put putting a, a show on it and trying to change the Strongman game. So you'll see the top 15 athletes coming over here to compete to do that. So that sort of stemmed from Emirates Strength. And hopefully, that makes Emirates Strength a bit more robust in the foundations and we can sort of grow Emirates Strength at the same time. So Scotland's and Britain's strongest man under 105. Scotland's was earlier this year. Um, obviously for Britain's I had to qualify through Scotland's. 
in Scotland there were six events. Um, the first event was the Max Axe Press. The second was the yoke into a dummy carry. The third was the silver dollar deadlift. The fourth was the frame carry. And then the fifth was the Atlas Stones. The sixth one, in fact, sorry, yeah, there's only five events in that. But surprisingly, Scotland's was more difficult than the Britons. Yeah, it was a lot, a lot more difficult. I remember after the competition being absolutely done in. Um, British Strongest Man, same again, five events, but they were, they were a little bit different. It was Max Deadlift, which is obviously my favourite event, um, Log Press for Repetitions, Farmer's Carry, Keg Carry, and um, Keg Toss. Keg Toss sort of replaced the, the Atlas Stone, the classic Atlas Stones. Um, it wasn't too taxed on the body, the Keg Toss, it was more about speed. Um, with the preparation for these events, obviously I, I sort of laid out what events I had and I would structure my training specifically for those events. For example, you don't see any squatting or anything like that, so I would try and avoid squatting. Right? Everything would be very specific to each event. And how I would normally do it is, day one would be a pull, which would be my deadlifting. Any pulling movements that I would do, so for example, farmer's walk includes a pull. So I would focus on day one pulling events, so deadlifting, focusing on the accessories with that, and finishing with farmer's walks. Because they all sort of tap in deadlifting, you, you work on your grip, farmer's walk, you work on your grip. Pushing, um, if you notice, there was a max axle, which is an overhead press, and a log, I would fixate day two on pushing. Right, because the, the pickup would be nice and light, so I wouldn't be over frying my back from the day before, and I'd be going into my pressing movements and work my accessory movements. And then the third, I would focus on conditioning, the conditioning to the movements. So you've got any of the carrying events with the yoke, the baby carries, the sandbag carries, that would be where I'd work on repetition, repetition, repetition of that movement. And I would take two days off and I'd go into my strongman day, which I would line up three of the strongman events in that day, and I'd work on it for three, four hours. So I would, I would work on building the weight up, doing that event, completing that three times, and then going to my second event, building the weight up, doing that event three times, and then the third event. So I would try and do them back to back, simulating what would happen on the day. Because what happens, with strongman is people don't prepare themselves for five events in a row. It's a bit different to powerlifting where you're doing only three movements and they're all using the same system. Strongman you're using the static strength, you're using the cardiovascular system, you're using the speed, you're using type one, type two. It's, it's a mix. So you need to get your body, your nervous system firing for that. Um, and the golden square. Um, so the golden square is what I like to call your mix of training, nutrition, rest, and can anyone guess the last one? No. Can you maybe guess it? Mobility? No. Movement? So to do a mental? No. So the golden square, and this is, it's a very, what's the word? Not frowned upon. Uh, controversial. It's performance enhancers. I want to speak today on it because this is so pertinent in the sport. Um, the Golden Square can only be completed with this. And competing at a high standard with top end athletes, this is included. Right. I'm not going to bullshit, this is included in, in the, the sport. And um, a lot of people sort of tiptoe around it, but I think at this level, if you want to be the best, you've got to do whatever it takes to be the best. And if you're not doing that, do you deserve to be the best? And all the top athletes will tell you that. Or right, maybe hush hush about it, but they'll tell you that. So you say the strong man. Um, there is not, I, 
across the board from rugby, football, bodybuilding, MMA, across the board, these guys want to be the best. So they'll do whatever it takes to be the best. Um, obviously, this is with the knowledge. Injuries. So during um, Scotland's on the lead up, um, during training, I think it was my second last strongman uh, events day. Last one that I was going to pick up, I tore my bicep. Um, with injuries, I've always sort of took it as a, as a, a physical training instructor in the Marines. I always took it as, as uh, if you get an injury, you try and work around that injury in order to, to achieve, not just rest and, and give up. Um, if you're always driving forward, whether it's 100 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, you should be always pushing forward. So that sort of happened. I took a week off and sort of managed to work around that movement until the day, the day of the competition. And I did it again. So you see like it's like a small partial tear in the bicep. Yeah. No, this was the atlas bone, so the tension was all going through my bicep. Oh, no. And it's common in it when you do with it. Yeah, it's common. The deadlifting, yeah. It's common with <laughs> over and under. That's why straps get involved. Um, what else happened, injury-wise? Yes, my finger. Oh, is that, that was before as well. So, <coughs> two weeks before, I managed to dislocate my pinky <laughs> on farmer's walks. So, I dislocated my finger. Again, I had to focus on rest and recovering and working around it for it to heal for me to compete. So, with the injury side of it, again, I'm always about pushing forward, whether it's going one way or working around it and going another. So, again, to be at the top level, you've got to push that way. Um, and in the same with Britain's strongest man, I managed to uh, split open my hand. I had like, four stitches in my pinky. Uh, where I split my hand open from glass. And I think it was, again, 10 days, 12 days before um, I did it. Sorry, it was, it, was, it was 16 days before I did it. I got it strapped up. Then 12 days out, Eddie Hall, X, Y, and Z came out. And it was my day to, day to deadlift. So what did I do? I went deadlifted. <laughs> but again, I'm a believer in doing whatever it takes to get to the top. So I, I, as a normal person, you wouldn't risk busting that open again. But being as daft as I am, I did. Uh, and I managed to bust this back open on the keg toss when I tried to catch a keg. Has anyone seen the keg toss video? Yes. Yeah, you see me trying to catch it. Anyway, programming. Does anyone do strength programming? Do you guys do any? No? <laughs> strength programming, so there's a, there's a lot of ways to do strength programming. Um, Powerlifting is going to be a lot different to strongman. Um, what, how I like to work it is one week light, one week heavy. And I'm talking heavy, no more than 80%. All right, your light week should be 50 to 60%. Your heavy week should be no more than 80%. No more. Unless you're peaking. I'm not kissing you. Oh, listen. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, that, that concept is good when you're working repetitions, but when you're working weight and you're working against your nervous system, you're just going to fry your nervous system. You need to build your nervous system to cope with that weight. Because you'll do it, you one rep max, you repair, say it takes two weeks to repair, you go in, you do the one rep max again. You're not advancing. You need to focus on building, building blocks. Um, again, I would start work it in the same format as day one, pull, day two, push, day three, conditioning, two days off, strong man, rest, back to the start. So one week light, one week carry. And then peaking, or what I like to call peaking, with strong man, um, it's all about rest, recovery, rehab, uh, Ray there, he done a lot of my FST treatment with fascial stretching, chiropractor, uh, deep tissue work. That is what peaking is in strong mind, is focusing on recovery. Recovering. How, how much do you do that? What's that? Like not the enough. Recovery, the recovery not, stuff. Not enough. Because, I'll give you an example, I've deadlifted one week yeah. and I've fried my back, got really tight hip flexors, 
Maybe someone touch your squat in the deadlift now. Yeah. I'm mid back just for bang and I can't move. I don't I don't think you can do knee half enough. You, you I think you can do yeah. it. Yeah. It's 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 always a two way street. There's always like the mobility and stretching and releasing and, and the fit break down was hard to shoot, but then relearning good movement patterns again. So the original reason why this happened was that the movement pattern was wrong. So maybe just taking a step back and reanalyzing and saying that you know yeah. instead of just going in and deadlifting just the way I always did, just learn a new move, like learn what went wrong with the movement pattern and hire a good coach for that. Yeah. Like, and I think assessment. once a week is, is perfect. If you find someone who understands what you do and once a week keeping that maintenance rather than doing what I do and, and to, uh, tweak something and go, can you help me out? You need to keep on top of it. It can never be done enough. Um, but the last seven to ten days is all about rest, recovery, focusing on mobility, mobility of the movements that you'll be doing at the event, but not expect like um, not pushing yourself. So you're resting yep, seven to ten days? Yep, seven to ten days of rest. And that, that's I'm so big on it. Yeah. I'm so big on it. Because a lot of power lifters. That feels a lot long though, no? If you keep your cardiovascular system running. It's perfect. So you want everything to recover. Yeah. If, you, if you see, if anyone's seen my Instagram, you'll see me uh, peaking the weights up. And I'll get to the point where I'm absolutely frying myself. And I fry myself at 360 kilos. I rested 7 to 10 days and I put 23 kilos on my deadlift. I could have put more. But that's what that recovery is. And that's what all, it's all about. It's building your nervous system to cope, 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 cope. Yeah, that's what made blow. Build. And it doesn't happen, honestly, it doesn't happen that like you're, you're not going to build 60 kilos in your deadlift in a year. I'll be very surprised if you could. And, and, and if you're doing that naturally as well, it's, it's a different story. Um, 20 kilos in a year is a lot. 20 kilos in a deadlift. 20 kilos in a year? Yeah. But bear in mind, I'm talking 20 kilos over 10 days, but my previous one at max was 350, which was two years ago. So, you know what I mean? I've built that over two years. Um, everyone happy? Any questions? So, the deadlift. Um, everyone here deadlifts. Yeah? Does anyone sumo deadlift? Not oh, good. So, I, I, so the, 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 this I have to, I have to, <laughs> I have to start to release the tension. We have to do some. Yeah. Anyway, strong man doesn't allow sumo. There's no power left as well, there's one power left. Yeah. Um, this is to do with the range of motion. Yes. Yeah. Um, strong man is all about getting the weight from point A to point B. If you're going from B to C, it's a bit the <laughs> same point you put this one, you've got sumo. Um, you start to sumo. With strong man as well, all accessory equipment is allowed. So you're allowed to wear your suit, you're allowed to wear a belt, you're allowed to wear straps. Um, again, it comes back to that point I activated before and saying if you want to be the best, you do whatever it takes to be the best. If you're not using accessory equipment, you're being silly. Um, because there's a lot of let's say, raw lifters and strong men that say, oh well, I'm raw, it's like, well, you're still not the strongest, it doesn't matter, so. And what would you say the essential accessories are? Straps? So straps, elbow, um, elbow sleeves, knee sleeves, suit, um, belt, all that sort of stuff. The sleeves sort of, are they more about stopping you getting injured rather than you having to do The sleeves, I just mean in general, you can use sleeves, but um, what I would normally wear is, Straps, belt, suit, and that's it. Um, does, has anyone seen figure of eight straps? Yeah. Ah, so yeah. So the yeah. So that I saw Eddie Hall on the uh, twelve days out from Britain, and he said, "Why are you using those straps?" He said, "I've always used them." He said, "Get figure of eights." So the day before I flew, does anyone know Scott Walker? Anyway, I was like, look, I need, I need figure of eights. And he was like, yeah, okay, no worries. And I used it the first time ever, I used it on the comp, and it's the best decision I've made. Figure of eight straps make a massive difference. And again, it comes back to that point, if you're not doing what it takes, or using what you can to be the best, then. but figure of eights are definitely better than normal straps. Um, 
types of deadlift in strongman. You've seen normal deadlifting, you've seen normal deadlifting with an Olympic bar, with a Texas bar, an elephant bar. Has anyone seen the elephant bar before? Hathor Bjornsson, he's got the world record in the elephant bar. It's, it's massive. It's bigger than the standard bar and the sort of plates up to this thick. So the weight's further away from your body essentially. And then we've got silver dollar deadlift, which is part of the very tights. Uh, deadlift. Silver dollar, has anyone heard of it? Silver dollar is basically from the 18 inches up. Like uh, a rat bull. Like a rat bull, yeah. It's famous in the States because they used to stack silver dollars in the um, boxes. boxes, yeah. And they would lift the silver dollar. Um, the elephant power, what difference does it make if the white being wide? Does it make it easier or harder? harder? Again, it will keep the weight grounded for longer. And there's more whip in the bar. It's harder. It's harder. Questionable. Questionable. Um, I would say the hardest is probably the stiff bar. Because the weight's compact, it's grounded. If you think if there's flex in the bar and the, the weight's far away from you, it stays grounded, the initial pull doesn't start to appear. Yeah, so can. again, it's, it can be classed up really tight. Well, you've got two inches. It's yeah. Slow, isn't it? yeah. But uh, the record is only for 100 and something. 472. Um, with the elephant bar as well, it's used in Arnold's. So it's part of a strongman competition. Whereas Eddie Hall's record was a deadlift championship. So it was solely, purely deadlift. Ah, no. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Um, strongman and the brute strength approach. Um, a lot of powerlifters are very technical. They're all about technique and being very clean. Strongman, it's, again, it's all about moving the weight from point A to point B. Hitching, is it, does everyone know what hitching is? You've seen me doing it in my deadlift. Hitching is allowing strongman when you drop down into the movement and deadlift up. Again, moving the weight from point A to point B. It's not advised, I don't advise it. That just shows weakness in my deadlift. For me, that's what that shows. That shows me what I need to work on. Yeah. That deadlift should be clean from point A to point B, but you are allowed to hitch. That's where you, that's where you sort of drop the back down and, uh, out of the movement and use your quads instead. So I, you put it on your knees, right? You put a percentage of the weight on your knees. Uh, I had bruises on my, my thighs. I have seen someone deadlift, and this was at the Britons, genuinely deadlift up, squat down. And squat it up. I've seen that, yeah, and it's allowed. It's allowed, but I wouldn't advise it. It just shows weakness. Um, and again, with the deadlift and strongman, it's normally followed by four or five events. Um, a bit different to powerlifting, where there's only two more events. Um, so that's why I, I think strongman is probably the uh, most impressive if you're doing a deadlift as part of. Competition that's strong man related. Right, how to improve? So everyone's deadlifted in here before. What what I like to do with my clients as well is focus on the breakdown of the movement. So you've got two parts of the movement, which is the leg drive, the initial pull, and then the lockout. So we break it down into two movements. You then want to focus on the timing of the movement, so where the timing of your lockout comes in. What a lot of you see a lot of people do is they'll deadlift up and they'll raise their hips first. Or like that overload the hamstrings and then it just turns into a full uh, back movement, lower back movement. Is that you, is it? So you want the, the movement to be timed correctly. How I like to, to focus on the timing is as soon as the bar is above my knees, I focus on locking my knees out, not my hips. What a lot of people do is they come up above the knee and the hips come through. Yeah, that's right. Yeah? That in strong man would be class a lockout. Or in any, any lifts. What you want to focus on is the lockout of the knee. If you lock the knees out faster than your hips, your hips are going to automatically come through. Alright? What, 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 what muscle are we using to lock the knees out compared to? Because you've got the glute to push the hips. Hamstrings and glutes. Hamstring. If you use your hip thrust is normally lower back and glutes. Hamstrings and glutes 
Oh, that initial fire for the for the um, locker. So it's the cover is a successful lift. As long as you straighten your legs or your knees. If you're locked out and, and the, the shoulders are pulled back. Rough over, is it right? If your shoulders are pulled back, you need to have your shoulders pulled back, yeah. Um, but that's when the lower back com becomes involved in the lats. So when you've broken down the movement, the timing, you want to pinpoint, uh, pinpoint the weaknesses. Again, so we've got two factors to focus on, the leg drive and the lockout. I would always, always, always focus on leg drive because it's the first stage of the movement. If you can't get the weight off the floor, you're never going to find that second weakness. So. This was something I always focus on was leg drive and it got to a point where I was forgetting about the lockout which was apparent when I did my last deadlift. So now I'm focusing on more on the um, lockout part. So you want to pinpoint your weakness, but always focus on leg drive. So you can't get off the floor at most point. Forms of deadlift, so there's four forms of deadlift that I like to use as part of training. Speed, deficit, banded and block. Speed, um, I like to focus on volume and how fast the bar moves. Okay, so from point A to point B, I want that bar moving as fast as possible. Alright, and that's, there's nothing involved, special involved with it, it's just a deadlift, and I'm focused on speed. I then like to carry that on to deficits. Deficits, all it is, is the, you're on a platform, about a two inch platform, so the range of movement is increased by two or three inches. Alright, so that is more focused on your leg drive, the initial push, so you're driving more through the legs. Again, I refer that back to speed, I want to focus on the speed of the movement, so I create a speed deficit deadlift. Yeah? Then banded. Banded um, is mostly focusing on the lockout part of the movement, where the acceleration, you have to focus on acceleration and the lockout. As it's banded, the tension increases. Yeah, so it's actually getting heavier to the lockout, which works more power on the lockout. And then block is isolating that second half of the movement from the knees up, so the weights are above the floor, and again, focusing on the lockout. Has anyone done these movements before? No? With the deadlift, when you're training for the deadlift, you should always focus on the speed of the bar, not the weight. Weight you can build up over time, but the speed of that bar. I'll show you at the end um, what I mean by that, alright? And then, just as important as your accessory movements. So you're obviously working different, um, different muscle groups, or you're working a lot of muscle groups. The main movements I use are leg press, hamstring raise, glute hamstring raise, glute bridges, bent over rows, seated rows, lat pull downs, and grip movements. How we do these movements is going to be different from anyone else in the gym. Like your average bodybuilder will be focusing on squeezing, slow repetitions, or your general population will just be moving the way. What you should be focusing on here is explosive movements. So when you're doing the leg press, nice and controlled down and explosive through. You're trying to push that uh, without locking your knees out, you're trying to explode the movement through. Same with hamstring raise, nice and slow, controlled down, and fire. Because we're hitting different muscle fibres doing that, rather than your contractions. We're just trying to fatigue your muscle. Um, same with the glute hamstring raise, you're leaning over the top, like a good morning. Nice and explosive back up. All these movements need to be explosive. And I normally work volume on this. I don't worry about weight. I normally work about eight repetitions. Three sets of eight repetitions on each of these movements. Um, and then the grip movements, I sort of tie in with the farmers walk, like I said before. Because um, grip, although you're using straps, comes into play. Although you're using straps. Any questions on accessory movements? When you're doing the accessory movements, think everything is transferable to your deadlift. So for example, if you're doing, let's say, leg press, you wouldn't go in and have your legs set up like this because it's not. It's going to hit different muscle groups. You would pick the exact same stance that you would deadlift in, your knee position in the lot, and you transfer into that because you're going to fire through the same muscle groups. 
anything slight that's off, or you change, is not going to have the same effect on the deadlift. Same with rows, seated rows. Is that a hand position? Your hands are going to be in your deadlift? Or no? You want to be in the same position, so you're firing off the same muscle groups. Uh, same with the other. Pull down, bend over rows. Exact same. Um, a few tips on deadlifting. I always like to have a four second rule. And this comes in with mindset as well. You get people to go up to the deadlift bar and they'll pull the weight and they'll be like, I can't move it. And then they'll step back, go again, do it again, can't move it. They'll take about four or five attempts and, and, and then they move it. Yeah. And then they move the weight. They're just cycling themselves out. So I like to have the four second rule. If I, if I see you straining for four seconds and you can't move it, you can't move it. But normally it'll be a case of one, two, and three, it starts moving. All right, so always have that four second room. Uh, another in one mind, this one. Count to four. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just wasting your energy. If you're having five attempts, and you get it on the fifth one, you've wasted your energy for the first one. You see what I mean? So you said, count to four. Pull that bar. Pull it for a second. Count for four, four seconds. seconds for that one. Nothing's yeah. happened, then you cannot pull it. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than taking five attempts at it. Yeah? Uh, shoes, I like to focus on heel to ground. Uh, powerlifters will say different, right? Uh, I always say about Converse. Converse are the best shoes you can use for deadlifting. If you're putting force through your heel and it's spongy, it's only absorbing that power. Yeah? I'm sure you'll have different view. Yeah? yeah? Same? Uh, and then mindset. Deadlifting is all about mindset. Um, like I said before, if you're taking five attempts to pull something and you pull it in the fifth, there's something wrong in your head. You've got to be determined to pull that thing up. Um, I think that Eddie, Eddie Hall taught me, and he's, he's just, he just started to sort of feed this out. It's when he went to do the 500 kilo, every time he stood, stood up to the bar or anything like that, he focused on his children being under this car and he was trying to deadlift this car off his off his children. Um, so it's about getting into that mindset, channeling your anger or your pain or whatever into that movement. And that's the best way to do it. But that's a big one on deadlift is uh, mindset. Mark, can I ask you yes. deadlift, right? Do you um, do you kind of take the weight and then explode or just explode? Just, just, just accelerate just, from the get go. Just slow accelerate from the get go, yeah. Does that not, um, does that not cause like room for injury on your, on your back or your... So with, with everything, with, with any sport, conditioning is important. If you condition your body to accelerate at a lighter weight and gradually build the nervous system, build, 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 you your body's it. conditioned to do ridiculous things. There's too many people that are textbook now and say, oh, you can't, you can't hunch over like this. But if your body's conditioned to do that, you know what I mean? I wouldn't get a general population client coming in going, right, wait to put everything into this one round match. Yeah. Gymnasts, look at gymnasts, look at what they can do. Look at, for example, boxers. Their bodies are conditioned to take an impact. And, I, that, and that's what's wrong with, let's say, the fitness industry here, today, whatever. It's, too many people are textbook. Too many people are textbook. Your body is conditioned to do ridiculous things. And if you stick to the textbook, where are you going to be? You're still with that textbook or on a podium, do you know what I mean? So don't be scared, unless you're obviously whacking in first time. Um, if you've got the wrong sort of shoes, do you recommend doing a barefoot or? Yeah, I mean. You brought me to take my shoes off and do a barefoot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, with, the, the thing with just running shoes is just the sponge is made to absorb impact and it's made to cushion your joints. Um, barefoot, yeah. Anything that's going to give you that heel to ground connection that you need to drive, perfect. People, uh, uh, people can use, well, I've seen people use Vans, and Converse, I use Converse. But it's whatever you're comfortable in with the flat soles. Good, I'm happy. No questions. Are you going to show us a 300 kilo pull now? 
I'll show you a few, <laughs> I'll show you a few videos, right? So, how, how I like to train, sorry for the bad quality uh, videos, uh, is focusing on speed. Um, so, before you go, uh, go into that, mm -hmm. the position of your hands in the bar, does it, make, uh, does it have to be comfortable for you? Does it matter um, why? Sorry, I'm sure I went over that. So, when you're deadlifting, you want to act as a coiled spring. If you're super wide, you're not going to have that same effect as if you're in nice and tight to your knees. You want to create pressure between your forearms and your hand positioning on that build-up. So I would say just wider than your knees. Mm -hmm. Alright, but no, you see a lot of taller guys, they'll deadlift super wide, but their quads are actually tucked into their arms when they're deadlifting. So you want to be in that nice coil position where you can push your knees out into your hands. Yeah? That, that's creating that okay. tension on its own, yeah? So you want to think like a coil spring, because essentially that's where you are in that position. I'm going to show you a few videos here. Um, coming back to focusing on speed. This is um, a few or slideshow videos that I did from the start of the year up until now. Just to show you a progression of how the bar moves at certain weights. Alright? Um, with the triangle of strength, does everyone know the triangle of strength? Speed plus power equals strength. Yeah? So this is me focusing on the speed element of strength. Yeah? This weight is 180 kilos and it must have been. Uh, Start of the year, 180 kilos, and I'm focusing on the speed of the movement. Right, so if you notice there, the speed's not great. Alright, but coming back to your point, you see my hips are a bit high, but I drop them and go. Yeah. So again, that's me trying to focus on leg power, driving through my legs. So, and you're not focusing on, on keeping your back straight, no, right? No, Not at all. Uh, but with my deadlifts as well, you see my back is slightly yes. bent. A lot of people will disagree with this, but my body's conditioned to, to, to lift that way. I think that's just your lats are a bit big. So my lats are a little bit bigger. You see there, there's, there's, there's a, a hunchback there. But my body's conditioned to deadlift that, and it always has been. Uh, so you've got a strong back. As, as long as you're, it's, it's to do with the, the, your spine, correct me if you're wrong. If you're releasing the spine, my, back, my back's under tension there, and my spine's under tension in that position. If you're releasing the spine, that's when it Obviously, becomes, yeah. yeah, that's when it becomes very hard. What's that? It will be very hard if you Yeah, so if you release that tension, that's when it's... What? Why do you always slow the bar? Like, just, it's, so, it's just releasing. Like, yeah, so I've never done that. No, no, no. So, just looks like showing off. But, but so dead, like, no, no, I understand. Yeah. When, when you deadlift, you're focusing on A to B. That B to A does not matter. It doesn't matter. So, okay, doing a negative, this. doing a negative is going to have, oh, it will have partial uh, benefit. But for me, when I'm focusing on that acceleration from A to B, B to A, I'm trying to control it down at the blink without exam. So I'm trying this? not to waste the energy when I'm going down. Yeah? So I'm, I'm always focusing on that power up, controlled down. So I'm releasing the bar without exerting anything. Like that, that B to A, I'm, I'm not putting any strain into it. So you're just releasing it like that? So I'm releasing it, my hands are still like, I've got wraps yeah, on, yeah, yeah. but I just release. The tension. So you're not actively throwing it down. No, 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 I'm not throwing. I'm not throwing down. It's it's, it's just that release of tension. He's just he's down the so he doesn't get the shock in the elbow. Yeah. Yeah. So that was 180, and then going into I think this is 180 again, but a few weeks, a few, few like a month or two later. So progressively moving faster now. Focus 
on the hips coming through and overloading the back, extending the movement further than you need to. Whereas the knee, as soon as it comes above the knee, these knees lock out, and that develops the speed. Right, so the benefit of you're at the top position and you're then stressing the, the movement, that's basically just a bit more exertion on the last, right? Yeah, you're putting nothing more than. And, and you're, you're increasing that range of the movement, whereas you should be focusing on the speed and engaging the hamstrings and glutes. This, this, the speed that dictates on how quick you lock out the knees. If you don't lock them out quick, that's when you start hitching, that's when you start grinding the ribs out. Um, this is moving on to 220. This one, this one is, is that? I think this is maybe just before Scotland, I think it was. So the weight starts off at a lesser weight and it increases to 240. So it starts at 220, it goes up to 240. So I built up to 250, it started to move slow, so I dropped it back down to 220, but with a band it was 240. So I'm building it back up to keep the pace. Yeah? Do you understand that? So I start to add in these little bits, like uh, the speeds with the bands, and the next one's going to be um, deficits with a band. Right, so I'm doubling up. It's going to be 220 with a, sorry, it's going to be 180 the next one with a 60 kilo band on a deficit, which I'll show you. And this was last week. You see the differences in the speed, but I've gradually built up the, um, let's say, the difficulty in the movement. So you see I'm on a 2 inch platform and the band is 60 kilos. It's not that much. So it's increasing the range and the tension increases at the top. So I'm focusing on the blocking. So if you notice know, the first half of the movement is fast, and then in the second half I'm trying to work on the lockout, which is my weakness. Alright, and then if you notice as well, the reps are in 10, 15. I'm focusing on low range and focusing on sets. If you wouldn't see a sprinter sprint a thousand meters when he's a hundred meter sprinter, he would do a hundred meters repetitively. Yeah? Or he'd break down and do 50 meters, that's the initial 50 meters, rather than doing 500 meters, he would do 50 meters 10 times. See what I mean? Yeah? So you keep the reps low, work on sets. So you're fresh for the second set, fresh for the third set, fresh for the fourth. Get what I mean there? Um, so let's go really go back to my programming now. I would focus that light work, what I just did there, one week, and then the second week I gradually build up my nervous system. So I would start around 70% and then keep up to 75% more on my own rep max, 80%, and so on and so forth. Alright? I tend not to go on 80. This is around 80. Alright, this is 340. And all I'm trying to do here is get used to the suit, I've got a suit on, get used to wearing my belt, get used to the Texas bar. Alright, so getting used to the heavier movements, getting my nervous system coping with it. And you notice these are ground reps. I should have pinpointed my weakness, 
changed my, my routine for the next week and focused on the lockout. Um, and that's something I've learned from. All right. Any questions? Any final questions? Uh, for general population, I e. Yes, yeah, yeah. You want to be strong, but you don't have the time to be strong. Um, we need to create that. What, 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 what would you say? Right, so pinpoint weakness. Yeah. Right, so my weakness, uh, for example, glutes are hamstrings from yeah. the operations of whatever. Right, so pinpoint that. Yeah. Uh, focus on ex um, explosive exercise. Yeah. Is there any two or three exercises that you would say focus on first? So, are, are, you, are you talking about strongman or deadlifting? I'm just talking about deadlifting. Deadlifting. So, the pinpoint of your weakness is at the lockout or is it the initial leg drive? Lockout. 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 So, what I've learned with the lockout is to simulate the lockout movement but overload it. So, like the banded work, I've got the acceleration in my legs but as the movement increases, it slows down. Are you talking about accessory movements or like yeah. leg press or something? Yeah. So accessory movements with the lockout is glute bridges, glute ham raise. Um, let me get the list back up. I'll just, I'll just point it to you. So your glute bridges and glute ham raise are going to be the ones that are, are helping your lockout. Yeah. The glute ham raise. You've done the glute ham raise before. We are at an angle, and you're leaning over the top. And you're powering up, just like a good, good morning, yeah, similar to a good morning, but do that with dumbbells. Yeah. So what I'll get the dumbbells, I'll wrap my hands in, and I'll go through the movement, power movements, focusing on the lockout. Um, again, focusing on that slow negative or controlled negative and powering up. Slow controlled power. Up. Same with glute bridges. You're simulating that hip drive, but the knees get involved. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? As I say, the leg press and the hamstring raise are all to do with the leg drive. The glute hamstring raise and the glute bridges are to do with the lockout. Same with the bent over rows, the seated rows and the lat powder. You'll be surprised, they're to do with the lockout as well. Because at the top, not only are you locking your hips, you're locking your back. So you need that initial or the last pull of the back to, to lock out fully. Alright? Any final questions? No? All good, Becky, you good? Yeah? If you like this video and want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. F I was going to say if not again. And follow us. Yeah, okay. follow okay, us. Okay, okay. Okay. And follow us at Emirates Strength, at Wish Dubai, or at Proud Project Generation Strong. Thanks.